Hi, everyone. This morning, we're going to go back to 2 Chronicles 20. I shared a message a couple of weeks ago uh, from that story, which I think we could all connect with. But I don't feel that as a church and as a people that we are finished there yet. Today, I want to look at a different part of that chapter. And uh, so if you have your Bible and you open it up to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to read from verse 5 this morning. We're going to look at the resolve that it said King Jehoshaphat had when he heard of the bad news of the armies attacking him. What was the first thing he did? The scripture teaches us here from verse 5 that he went to the Lord in prayer. So we're going to pick up this story from verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said... O Lord God, our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all of the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying... If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before the temple that bears your name and we will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. Verse 10. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Here we see the situation that King Jehoshaphat has resolved himself to go into God in prayer. You know, previously in chapter 20, it says when he heard the news, he was afraid. And we've heard news recently that maybe we feel afraid. I want to encourage you through this prayer today that if we pray the kind of things that King Jehoshaphat prayed in that difficult season, just as he saw the supernatural power of God moving, just as he saw God intervene and win a battle on his behalf and on the people's behalf, that we will experience the same kind of intervention, the same kind of miracle working power in our lives because the word of God is the truth. And when we have faith in God and in his word, the Lord will move on our behalf. We see in this story, as we uh, saw a couple of weeks ago, what had happened that the um, King Jehoshaphat's men had come to him and told him that three armies have encamped together and they're coming up on the blind side down in the desert there and they're coming up. Actually, they're already here and they're ready to attack. And King Jehoshaphat wasn't prepared. And it said he was afraid and his resolve was in God. And then in verse 5, it teaches us here that King Jehoshaphat went to the temple to pray. You know, it's a great thing to do that when we hear bad news, that we put our resolve in God our Father. It's so important that that is the first thing that we choose to do. And uh, also that we choose to pray. And we see here from verse 5, Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly You know, people were watching what he did. And when we're in difficult times, people are watching what we do. Oh, Lord God of our fathers, he said. He begins reminding God of the past ways in which God moved through the ancestors, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and at Joseph. And you know, he's calling on God. He's calling on God of our fathers. You know, we are born from the seed of Abraham, the father of faith. And he's reminding God, he's took himself and he's positioned himself and he's reminding God that you are the God of our fathers. And what he is actually saying by doing that is, he's reminding God and he's reminding himself, the miracles that you gave our fathers in the past, you can do today. Just as God gave Abraham a miracle. Remember the story when Abraham, uh, God came to him and said, you will have a son. 
And Abraham thought, how ridiculous, how crazy is that? I'm 100, Sarah's 90, her womb is barren. But yet the word of God came to pass. The miracle happened. The word of God is the truth. And I just want to encourage you this morning that you can take the situations in your life that look dead and you can trust God and you can go to your father in prayer and you can see the resurrection power bring forth that which was dead. You can see that God can bring forth life even in the dead places of your life. You know, sometimes when situations look like they're impossible, like it was for Abraham and Sarah, God was still on the throne. Nothing is impossible to God when we believe. And here we see that Jehoshaphat is reminding us and he's reminding himself and he's reminding God in heaven, oh God of our fathers. He's saying, just as you bless them, just as you give them a miracle, I come to you today in the light of this bad news that I've been given, and I'm trusting that you will intervene in my life and you will give me a miracle. If you did it for Abraham and you did it for Isaac and you've moved for Jacob and you give Sarah a baby when she was barren, you can move for me today. We serve the same God church. We have the same heavenly father and he has the best for you. You know, there's a great quote that I heard from uh, a man called Martin Luther. And he says this, Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but it's laying hold of his willingness. And when we pray, that's what we're doing. We are laying hold of God's willingness to bless our lives and to meet us in our time and our hour of need. Let's look a bit further. He says, are you not the God of heaven? He's declaring God's dominion above. God is the God of heaven. Hebrews 1, 3 tells us that he sustains all things by the power of his word. God is ruling the universe without chaos. The stars are thrown into the sky. The sun is shining every day. The wind is blowing. The sea is where it ought to be in the ocean. God is not panicking due to the season that the earth is finding itself in. There is no chaos in heaven. And Jehoshaphat is reminding us to remind God. He is the God of heaven. There is no chaos where God is. And we can trust God that he will bring peace and joy and love, that he will bring strength. He will deal with fear in our lives and he will cause us to stand strong and believe him in this difficult time. He's saying, you can do that in heaven, God. And today I believe because you do that in heaven, you can do it here on earth. God is faithful and God is God in heaven and God is God on the earth. You can do that for me, Lord. So it's a good reminder. God can bring perfect strategy to our lives, to the situations that we are, that we are in and create perfect peace in the storm because he is God. You know, remember when Jesus said it to the disciples, oh, ye of little faith, when the storm arose, they woke him up to calm the storm. I want to encourage you this morning that you have the kind of faith in you. God has put the seed of faith in you that if you will develop it through prayer and the word, you can speak to your storm and you can command it to stop in the name of Jesus. You are still in control, even God, when the enemy is running wild. God is still in control in spite of what is happening in the world. And we need to fix our eyes on that fact. And we need to keep our faith strong in the reality that God is still in control and his dominion has rule in my life. Not what the bad reports say, not what people say, not what the news says, but what the word of God says, that I am protected in him, that he is my refuge, my shield, that I live in the shadow of his wing that he provides all of my needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. Are you not the God of heaven? So we declare the dominion of God above so that it will manifest itself on the earth here below. Then Jehoshaphat says, you rule over all of the kingdoms of the nation. We need to declare God's power and authority on the earth today. It's important for us to declare God's authority over our lives, over our families, over our work situations, over our bodies. We declare that you have rule over all of the kingdoms of the nations. We declare 
that he has rule and authority over all of the battles that we're in. You are the Lord over this world in spite of how it looks. Over every organization, over every business, over every nation, over every race, over every people, he is Lord. There is one Lord and his name is Jesus. We declare, God, today you are in charge of my life. Not the government, not my friends, not even my family. You, God, you are in charge of my life. Whether men acknowledge it or not, it is a fact that he is the ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations. We also then see power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. It's an incredible revelation to know that power and might is in the hand of God. We pray, Lord, let your hand be on our families this morning. Let your hand be on our businesses. Let your hand be on our marriages and our relationships. God, let your hand rule and reign in our lives. You know, your hand, there's such significant about the hand that it's speaking to us here. Habakkuk 3, chapter 3, verse 4 tells us of the hand where there is power hidden. There is hidden power in the hand of God. And as we pray, God, stretch out your hand and meet our needs this morning. Stretch out your hand and foil the plans of the enemy. Stretch out your hand, God, and cause wisdom to flow and the blessing of God to be on our homes. Stretch out your hand, God, because no devil and no coronavirus can withstand the hand of God because there is mighty power hidden in the hand. You know, as New Testament believers as Christians that live according to the New Testament, the New Covenant, we have a living testimony of the power of God in the hand. You know, Jesus died and the scripture teaches us that they put the nails through his hand and you know, those holes are still there today, testifying for eternity that he put all of what the world says is right, that he put his authority in place and the scars in his hand in eternity in heaven and in the time to come are a living testimony to us that he is committed for his power to flow from his hand into our lives there is power hidden power in the hand of God that power covers his people in the day of in the day of battle that power covers his servants to minister you know in Acts 18 uh, verse 10 Paul was uh, worried about staying in a city to minister But God spoke to him and he says, I am with you. No one is going to attack you or harm you. The hand of God was on Paul to preach the gospel. And the hand of God is on you to preach the gospel too. The hand of God is on his church that it will grow, it will flourish, it will be stronger than ever. It will increase, it will multiply, it will flourish. The hand of God is on his church, on on his bride. So Paul stayed, it said, a year and a half in that city because he had great confidence in the power and the authority and in the might that no one can withstand, which is in the hand of God. So let's have this confidence that he has stretched forth his hand to bless us as a people. He says in uh, further down, he says, Oh God, oh our God, I think this is an incredible declaration that King Jehoshaphat makes as he stands in the temple praying to God, our God. Jehoshaphat is revealing here his covenant relationship with his God. We have entered a covenant relationship with God. When we accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we entered into a covenant I don't know today whether people, this generation, understand the seriousness and the significance of a covenant. A covenant is a contract. It is a binding agreement that we enter into. It is a certainty of things to happen. It has statement and stipulations and it has promises attached to it. And here, Jehoshaphat is acknowledging his covenant. He said, our God. He's speaking to his father relationally. And we have a relationship with God, our father, through his son, Jesus. You know, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of uh, illustrations about how powerful the covenant, the uh, 
covenant of God was. And I just want to take us to a little story. You can read it later. We haven't got time to go into it in too much detail this morning. But in Joshua chapter 9, the Gibeonites wanted to come into covenant with Joshua because they understood what a powerful nation Israel was. So what happened, they sent the leaders of the Gibeonites, sent two men to Joshua and they deceived him. They came and they pretended that they were from in a far off land. They um, had food that had mold on it. So it looked like they'd had it for a long time. They were very clever at what they did. There were clothes that were worn out. And they came to Joshua and they pleaded with Joshua from their leaders, will you make a covenant with us, our tribe, the Gibeonites? So Joshua, because they were far off, in a far off land, agreed to this covenant. So Joshua said, okay, we'll do that. We'll go into covenant together. And then these men returned back to their land. Joshua wasn't aware at this point that he'd been deceived, that these men didn't live in a faraway land, but they lived in a nation that God had told them to possess. So when Joshua found out, obviously he was very angry and very frustrated. But what happened, when these men went back to their own people, went back to the Gibeonites, the surrounding kings in their area started to rise up. Several kings got their armies together and they planned to attack the Gibeonites because they were angry at them making a covenant with Joshua. So what did they do? The Gibeonites called on Joshua and they said, because you've made a covenant with us, you have to help us. And you see, this is the power of a covenant. You see, it meant because the Gibeonites had made a covenant with Joshua and his armies and his tribe that they were responsible for each other. A covenant means your battle becomes my battle. It means your need becomes my need. It means that we're in agreement in life, that we are committed to one another to the end. Today, I think we've lost sight of what covenant actually means. So here we see that Joshua rose up in chapter 9. He got his armies together and he went down. And he was committed to the Jebunites because he'd made this covenant. And they fought all day long. It's incredible if you read the story in chapter 9. Because although they were in battle all day long, they didn't deserve that help. They deceived to get this covenant Yet because the covenant was cut and the covenant was made, Joshua was obligated with all of his people to fight the battle with the Gibeonites. So what happened, they went down and they were in battle all day and the sun began to go down. And something miraculously supernatural happened. It says in verse 12 that Joshua did something that I don't think anywhere else in the Bible I've ever read anybody else doing this. It says that Joshua knew that the battle needed to be won that day. So he commanded the sun to stand still. How incredible is that? And guess what? It did. You see, covenant is a very powerful thing. Covenant stays with us till the job is done. And Joshua knew that the battle had to be won. So he called on God, who he had a covenant with. And he said, Lord, I'm asking that you will make that sun stand still so that we can win this battle. Now I say all of that to say this. These people, these Gibeonites, they didn't really deserve to have that covenant with Joshua. Yet Joshua stood by them in the battle they got their covenant and that relationship through deceit. But yet, when they were in battle and when they were under attack, Joshua was obligated because of the covenant to fight with them and for them together. I want to encourage you today that you might not feel worthy that you might think that God is not going to stand with me, that God is not going to make a covenant with me, that God is not going to fight my battles with me because I'm weak and I don't always get it right and I miss the mark sometimes. I'm here to tell you today that God, your Father, 
your heavenly father is committed to you more today than he ever was. That he loves you unconditionally. That the covenant that he has with you is not based on your weaknesses, but it is based on his strength and his commitment of love towards you and your future. So we can go to God in prayer in this difficult season and we can have this confidence that we have a covenant with God and my battle is his battle and I am not alone in this battle. I want to encourage you, affirm your covenant connection with your father in this season. Affirm the fact that God is for you, he is not against you and he is with you in the battle fighting for you. The battle is not yours, says the Lord. It's ours. God will fight with you and he will fight for you. Further down we see, Jehoshaphat then says, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? What Jehoshaphat is doing, he is rehearsing former victories that God accomplished for Israel to go into their promised land. When you pray, when you go to God, not if you pray and if you go to God. Jesus said, when you pray. And when we pray, we need to go to God and we need to remind him and we need to remind ourselves of the former victories of the past that we didn't think that we could make it through, that we didn't think we, we would survive, that we don't know how we managed, but we got through and we did survive and we walked in the victory and we are on the other side of that storm. We need to remind ourselves as we pray that God, as you took us through, those lands that were difficult, as you brought down the walls of Jericho for Israel, as you set the captives free, as you caused the people to go in and possess the land that you had prepared for them. God, you are the same God today and I am your people. I am your child, God, just like the children of Israel and you did it for them, Lord, you will do it for me. God wants to bring down the walls in your life. God wants to bring down the hindrances that maybe the enemy has tried to put up to discourage you. That you're looking at and you, you're saying to yourself, I'll never get through this. I'll never get past this. I'm here to tell you today that God says he will bring the victory into your life. He is well able well able to bring them walls down, those barriers down that the enemy tries to put up to stop you from going in and possessing your promised land. Nothing can stop the purpose of God in your life. Remind God of the victories that he has wrought in your life in the past and praise him for them. Praise God for the victories that you've had and praise him for the victories that he is bringing. It says further down, and Give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. And give it, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants, verse 7, of this land before your people Israel? And give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you servant, I call you friend. What an incredible thought that we are the friends of God through his son, Jesus. And just as God looked at Abraham, just as God tread Abraham, as Abraham looked to God in faith and believed that he was who he said he was, just as we do that, we will see that as the descendants of Abraham step into everything that God prepared for them, that includes us, so will we. Jehoshaphat is rehearsing prayers for the people that God led through in the past. And it's important for us to remember that God has already taken us from darkness and brought us to light, but he has more for our lives. There, the best is yet to come. And God has more for your life God has more for your ministry. God has more for your family. God has more for your marriage. And he intends for us to go in and to possess that. He's going to give it to us because we are the descendants of Abraham. The promises of God are yes and they are amen.
God has give, just as God gave the children of Israel promises that they will go in and they will possess the land. I'm sure that God has given you promises for your promised land. There are 7,480 promises in the Bible for you to possess. That's your promised land. And God's intention is that we go in and we possess every promise because Jesus said, I didn't come for anything else but to give you an abundant life. What an incredible life that God has prepared for every single one of us. You know, the promises of God come through the written word, the Logos word. And as we read scripture and as we meditate in that, we see that God has promised to heal us. God has promised to provide for us. God has promised to keep us safe and protect us. God has promised to lead us and guide us into all truth. God has promised to, you know, give us eternal life and salvation. God has promised to deliver our lives from destruction. God has promised us that our children will be taught of the Lord and great shall be the blessing on their life. God has promised us that as we stand and agree in prayer, touching anything in the name of the Father, that we will get those things that we ask. God has promised us that we will go over to the other side, that the storm will not stop us. God has promised us that if you are sick in your body, by his stripes, you were healed. God has promised us that if we look like we have lack, just keep pouring, just keep pouring, and God will just keep filling. God has promised us that he will put new wine in new skins. God has promised us that a new day is coming. Behold, I do a new thing, says the Lord. God has got lots of promises for us. God says you will go in and you will possess that which I prepared for you ahead of time. So I want to encourage you. When you read the word, seek the promises of God for your life and for your family and for your marriage. God wants you to have success. He wants you to prosper and he wants your soul to prosper and he wants your spirit to be strong. And as we seek him in his word, the written word, the Logos word of God, the promises of God start speaking into our lives and we start walking in the victory and the fulfillment of what God has planned for us before the very foundation of the earth. Maybe you've got promises in your life that God spoke to you directly. A Rima word. Rima, when God comes to you directly and there's just an unction on a promise that God speaks to you. I can remember years ago when God gave me a promise, a Rima promise, a word just like that. I wasn't sitting reading my Bible. I wasn't even in my house. I wasn't at church. I was actually in a red telephone box. Now, I know for some of you young guys, you won't have a clue what that is. But in the past, in order to use the telephone, you had to go out into the public street. You had to find a red little box that looks like Doctor Who's TARDIS machine thing. It was red. And you would use the public telephone. You would put coins into this machine and you would use this phone. And this particular day, I was dating Aaron and uh, we didn't have much as a, uh, in my family and we didn't have a phone in our home. Some people in that day did, they were blessed people, and, uh, but we didn't. So I had to find this phone that worked so that I could ring my boyfriend. So off I went in my neighborhood. It was pretty rough where I lived. And you had to walk, I'd walk miles to find this telephone box that actually had a telephone in that worked. Anyway, I phoned Aaron after finding this phone. It took me ages. And his father answered the phone. And I said, you know, is Aaron there? And Aaron worked as an engineer at the time and he just had finished his shift. We would plan when he would be in so I knew he would be there to pick up the call. And his dad said to me, oh, I'm sorry, Marie, he's in the shower. So I'm standing in this red phone box and I'm thinking, right, okay, cool. Well, get him out because I've walked miles to find a phone that works and I want to speak to him. But God bless him, David didn't think of asking Aaron to come out of the shower. So to be polite, I said, oh, okay, then I'll just have to call him back. So before I finished um, talking, I heard David, and I was convinced it was the voice of David, but I heard very clearly in that phone box that day, go home, Aaron said, go home and read Psalm 115. 
So I thought, well, how random is that? How strange is that? So off I went and I thought, okay, I'll do that. And, you know, I went home and I read Psalm 115. And Psalm 115 talks about Aaron and it talks about the anointing on Aaron's life. And it talks about the anointing flowing down from Aaron's head, down his beard. And God will bless the house of Aaron and God will bless Aaron and his children. And Aaron's children were the Levitical priesthood, so they were male. I knew exactly that day what God was speaking to me. I'd been praying whether Aaron and I would marry. I knew he was called to the ministry. I knew it was a very big decision for my life. I knew I would have to be committed to the call of God on his life, to empower him to be the man of God that God intended him to be, to reach other people, to not struggle with having to be, you know, um, not always um, the, the most important thing, although I am, I know I am, but you know, sometimes his attention is given to the people of God. And I had to learn to submit to that and to flow with that and to let God be God in his life and in his ministry so that I could empower him to be everything that God had purposed and destined him to be. I knew that God was speaking to me that day. And the Lord was reassuring me in my heart that go ahead and marry him because that is my purpose for your life. Maybe there's a promise that God has given you. I want to encourage you to hang on to that promise. Don't let anybody steal the promises of God from your life. Pursue God. And as you pursue God, the promises that he has given to you will come to pass. And you know, we'll have been married this week 32 years is our anniversary on the 23rd of July. We usually spend it at a conference every year, rejoicing and praising God. I can't think of a better place to do that, but we are still celebrating. We got married. We've been married for 32 years. We've been together for 38 years, and we have two amazing sons. I knew that day I would be married and I would have sons. You know, God is interested in the detail of your life. So hang on to the promises of God. Stay strong. Let the Lord bless your life as you seek him in his word. As you seek his promises, the promises of God for your life, church, today are yes and amen. Let's look further down. It also tells us in verse 8, Jehoshaphat prayed this. They have built it in the sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name, and we will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. Here we see Jehoshaphat affirms the name of God over the temple of God. You know, the Bible teaches us not to forsake ourselves assembling together as such as some do. In this season, we can't come together collectively. But oh, I am so excited about the day coming when we can. What a party that will be. I want to encourage you, do not lose sight of the house of God and its significance in your life. It's not about coming to a building, but it is about being joined to a body. You see, when you join to a body, you have a supply and you bring a supply. I need you and you need me. There's that covenant relationship we have again together. So we need to understand that, you know, Jehoshaphat is bringing to attention the prayers. We honor God in the temple, the house of God, but we also honor God in this temple. The Bible teaches us, know you not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And where you find God's presence dwelling, you will find God's name. We've got to understand that God has given us the name of Jesus that is above every name, that at that name, every knee shall bow. And we have that name over our lives, protecting us and keeping us on a daily basis. If your presence is there, so is your name. The name of Jesus is so significant for us as believers today. It's our, it's our call, it's our privilege that we get to exalt the name of Jesus in our lives so that the Bible teaches us that if we lift him up, if we exalt the name of Jesus, that all men shall be drawn to him and shall be saved. We have a mission and it's to save the world for Jesus 
and we have a commitment to lift the name of Jesus up so that people can see a wonderful saviour that loves them. God is good and his blessing and his mercy flows every day over our lives. In verse 12, we see here coming to a close, Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. Maybe you felt like that recently, that you've got a vast army that is attacking you and you don't know what to do. I want to encourage us today as believers to let God be the judge of the situation. You know, we are not called to judge anybody. And Jehoshaphat is teaching us here what we should be judging. We should be judging and identifying the enemy's activity. Then we need to trust God to execute his judgment. We were called to a walk of love and forgiveness. We weren't called to a walk of judgment. We cannot judge anyone because we've never died to save anyone. That's God's right. And you know, God is a just God and he will judge righteously. But we don't have to get caught up with that. It's our job to forgive and to trust God and to walk in love. Leave the judgment to God when it comes to people. What God wants us to do and what Jehoshaphat is showing us here, that we need to be aware of the uh, maneuvers and the activity of the enemy behind what is going on, behind what we see. And we need to pray. You know, the scripture teaches us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers in high places. So our battle is not with one another. Our battle is with the activity of the enemy that comes to kill, steal and destroy. That's who we need to be attacking, not people, but the enemy that is trying to bring destruction in our lives through a different source. Jehoshaphat is saying, God, the Amorites, the Moabites, the dwellers of Mount Seir, they've come against your people. Will you not execute judgment? And so here we see, what is Jehoshaphat identifying? Is he attacking the people? No, he's bringing to the attention to God that this is what the enemy's activities look like. These armies are rising up and they're about to attack. And he asks God at that point, will you get involved? I want to encourage you, Ask God to get involved when you see the enemy is attacking in your life because God is more than able to cause you to be an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus because God wants to get involved and help you fight your battles with you. We have to identify how the enemy is maneuvering, how he is working in our families, in our businesses, anything that pertains to us. And then we need to stand strong we need to bring that before God. We need to leave the judgment to God and we need to walk in faith and ask God to get involved in what is going on. Our job is to walk in love and forgiveness. Let's be a people that are known for our love and known for our forgiveness. Then we see in verse 12, for we have no power, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. And I like what, I like, the, I like how humble, how honest, how real King Jehoshaphat is in this season and in this attack of his life. He says, we do not know what to do. You know, some people would say, well, isn't that doubt? Isn't that unbelief? Church, that's humility. That's identifying that in our own strength, we can do nothing. But with Christ, we can do all things because he is strengthening us. Humility is a very powerful thing for us to walk in in our lives. Within ourselves, we find weakness and failure. But admitting that we are not always strong, that we haven't always got it together, 
but we have God. We have this covenant. We have a father in heaven that has prepared a promised land for us. We have promises that have been given to us that are yes and amen to make our life increase and better. I can do all things because Christ is strengthening me. I can overcome my weakness through the power of the Holy Spirit that God has sent to live in me. We can live a blessed life if we decide to trust in God even although we are weak sometimes. Don't be afraid of your weakness. Give it to God. Because when we, you know, the Bible teaches that it is the meek that shall inherit the earth. The meek, the humble. And when we come before God humble and we lay ourselves on the altar of his mercy, we then will experience the grace and the abundance of God's goodness flow into our heart and as we feel empty, he will fill us up to overflowing with strength and grace and power and anointing. He said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So important, church. In the seasons of your life, in the difficulties, in the conflicts, in the challenging times, you may be suffering in your body, you might have sickness, you might have been going through a divorce, you might have kids that are, are not following God. Whatever your struggle is, I want to encourage you that you can experience the supernatural working power of God in your life as you make God the resolve in your life. Jehoshaphat said he was afraid, but he made his resolve in God. He said, here I am weak, but my eyes are on you. And if we make that commitment in our lives, if we make that commitment to our God, I believe just as King Jehoshaphat saw the supernatural answer to prayer, saw the supernatural intervention of God in this situation, so will you and so will I. Let's be a believing church. Let's be a believing people. Even if, even if I don't know what to do, God, my eyes are on you. Church, Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the goodness of God. Keep your eyes on the word of faith. Keep your eyes on the power of, of the Holy Spirit that is living in you, that is guiding you daily, that is giving you wisdom and grace from heaven. Keep your eyes on him. I'm praying in this season that your valley of conflict becomes your valley of blessing. You know, the scripture teaches us that the word Baraka, where they had to, you know, when they'd gone into that war and they, they, they overcame the armies that attacked them and all the people were rejoicing, it said that it took them three days to collect the plunder and they were in the valley called Baraka. And that word Baraka means the valley of blessing. So I'm praying that this week that your valley of conflict will become your valley of blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.